the story of the Beatles, how it's been told and retold, the agendas behind some of those retellings, and the difficult job of separating fact from fiction is the focus of a new book entitled The Beatles and the Historians, an analysis of writings about the Fab Four. And it was written by our guest today, Aaron Torkelson Weber. You know, this is a book I've been waiting for for the longest time. Well, actually, I should begin by saying welcome to the show. Well, thank you. (laughs) But as I was saying, I have been waiting for a book like this because I've long been fascinated by not only the Beatles story, but by the various interpretations of that story that have faded in and out of popularity over the decades, and people cling to their favorite ones, and they may not be correct or accurate versions of that story. So what prompted you to delve into this complicated latticework of Beatles literature? Well, I teach college history. I teach American history. And one of the classes that you have to teach or take as a history major is historiography and historical methods. Right. So I wanted to write this book because I started reading as a fan. And then when I did that, I started seeing the narratives fall into place, the differing versions of Beatles history, the differing authors who had either used the proper methodology or not used the proper methodology. So I thought it would make a great topic to write for what's basically a textbook, but also an interesting subject that college-age students would be very interested in because it also deals with mass media and a lot of a lot of historiographical subjects really don't in your book you divide the eras of beatles historiography into four distinct and in some cases very different narratives there's the fab four narrative the Lennon Remembers narrative, which is a reference to John Lennon's infamous 1971 interview for Rolling Stone magazine. Yes. The Shout narrative. Shout was the title of Philip Norman's uh, very influential biography of the group, published in 1981. And finally, the era that we're living in now, the Lewison narrative. That's a reference to uh, historian Mark Lewison, who's going through everything with a fine tooth comb for his uh, Tune In book series. And for better or worse, each of these narratives shaped the corresponding generation's opinion of the Beatles. So let's begin with the first one, the Fab Four narrative. Can you give us a a thumbnail sketch of what the Fab Four narrative, or I, I guess you could call it the official narrative, was all about? The official narrative is what they themselves promoted from about 1962 to 1970. And it consisted of three major elements, whitewashing, promoting the equality and necessity of the Lennon-McCartney partnership, and also emphasizing the band's friendship and unity. And that's what they're promoting in their press conferences, in their interviews, in movies like A Hard Day's Night. Right. And they do a very good job of it. Then that starts to erode in 1968 and 1969, and pretty much collapses with the McCartney press release. And certainly a big part of that Fab Four narrative was the authorized biography of the Beatles, the uh, Hunter Davies book. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of first-generation fans, that was the first substantial biography of the group they had ever read. But now, Beatle fans look back on that book and think of it as being somewhat sanitized. We've seen the letters to Hunter Davies from John asking for his Aunt Mimi to approve, you know, some of the text in the book. And speaking of Aunt Mimi, she tells a story, and you mention it in your book, uh, the famous story about the night John Lennon was born and the Nazis were bombing Liverpool. And there's this very dramatic story of John's mother, Julia, getting rushed to the hospital. And that story has been repeated in countless books about John Lennon and the Beatles. But we now know that there was no bombing on the night Lennon was born. It's a great story, and it was told, I guess, with the assumption that no one would ever actually go in and research and find out if that were true or not. And I guess that's kind of what I see not only in this authorized biography, but in a lot of the very early books about the Beatles, there's an emphasis on telling a good story as opposed to making sure all of the facts are correct. Oh, absolutely. I think you have to look at the authorized biography, and it's got a lot of value to it for a lot of, a lot of reasons. 
But that's one of the questions that the first question, really, you have to ask yourself when you read any authorized biography, whether it's about the Beatles or any individual, is how much objectivity or how much editing did the author surrender to the subject? Right. You have to look at the authorized biography in the context of trying to sell the Beatles mythology. We're speaking with author Erin Weber. Her new book, The Beatles and the Historians, is a fascinating look at how our perception of the history of the Beatles has been influenced over the years. And we've just covered the Fab Four narrative, which was the official version of the Beatles story as it was presented to the public during the 1960s, the emphasis being on friendship and camaraderie. Now we move on (laughs) to the Lennon Remembers narrative. Now, I should point out that it was not known to the general public that in September of 1969, John Lennon effectively left the Beatles. He was advised by his manager, Alan Klein, to pretend that everything was going all right when he spoke to the press because Klein was renegotiating the group's contract with EMI. Paul McCartney, on the other hand, who had never approved of Klein as a manager, finally went public with news of the breakup in 1970, and this caused the popular misconception that Paul was the instigator behind the group's breakup, when in fact he was the Beatle who had been desperate to uh, keep it all together. Now, the first major post-breakup interview with the Beatle was given by John Lennon to Jan Wenner of Rolling Stone in 1971. It was later published as a book called Lennon Remembers, and it lives on (laughs) in infamy. Aaron, would you say that this uh, interview is a significant part of Beatles historiography? Oh, absolutely. It's really one of the cornerstones of Beatles historiography. It it dominated their historiography throughout the 1970s and partially in consequence because of John's death, also through a major part of the 1980s. Yeah, this interview created a whole new narrative where pretty much the other Beatles and anyone connected to the group were diminished. Well, he goes after everyone except himself, Yoko, and Alan Klein, and he spends a significant part of the interview lobbying in favor of Klein. Which is ironic, because just a few years later, Lennon would wind up suing Alan Klein. But when this was first published in 1971, it was received as gospel, in particular by the uh, rock press. Yes. But of all the people that Lennon attacks during this interview, the person who suffers the most damage is Paul. Uh, I mean, this is where it all starts. This is where Lennon is heralded as the revolutionary genius of the Beatles, and then the press attacks Paul as this lightweight commercial hack, and it all stems really from this interview. And this isn't how people thought of Lennon and McCartney in the 1960s. This didn't exist in the Fab Four narrative. No, it didn't. You might have one author like a Nick Cohn who would say, I prefer John's stuff to Paul's, but also you'd have, I think it's a Kenneth Tynan, who would say, I prefer Paul's stuff to John's. Right. So it wasn't John versus Paul in the official narrative. You could like both of them. You could have a preference. Right. But they weren't pitted against each other. And one of the fundamental changes that the Lennon Remembers interview does is that it unfortunately pits John versus Paul. And that, to my mind, has had a serious impact, a detrimental impact on Beatles historiography ever since. As in the case of a lot of interviews given in anger or with an agenda behind them, either someone trying to build themselves up or forcing readers to take sides on an issue, some of the claims John made in this interview turned out to be untrue when more evidence came along. John, in fact, to his credit, recanted a lot of the more outrageous things said in this interview, like, you know, George Martin didn't produce us really, and, uh, you know, what has George Martin ever done? I mean, you know, things that were just ridiculous. But these retractions never seem to get mentioned in the books that use this interview as a source. No, they don't, for a variety of reasons. And first off, I would argue because Wenner continues to promote it as gospel really up through 2000. 
Right. Even as late as 2000, they're reissuing the Lennon Remembers interview, and there's no acknowledgement in there of John's exaggerations, of his unfair statements. At one point in Lennon Remembers, John claims he and Paul stopped writing together in 1962. Right. <laughs> and he claims 50% of the lyrics of Eleanor Rigby, which we have an enormous amount of evidence to indicate is incorrect. But Wenner continued to promote it as, as flawless truth for 30 years because it supported his own magazine to do so. Right. But you also have, when John does dismiss it, it's mainly, a, a lot of the times it's more in a private setting than it is a public one. He dismisses it to George Martin. He dismisses it to Glenn Johns. He does dismiss it in a public interview with which George Harrison also participated in. Right. And that's the major public instance, although, again, he, he admits in the 1980 Playboy interview, again, in particular with issues with the Lennon-McCartney partnership, that he was angry, and so he lied. Right. <laughs> what people need to realize is that John Lennon was a guy who would get in moods and <laughs> sometimes would just say whatever popped into his head when he was in one of those moods. Right, and you have a number of sources who will attest to that. May Pang, Ray Connolly, even Paul will basically say, you know, John would spout off and then want to forget what he had said. We're talking with Erin Weber today on the Vintage Rock and Pop Shop. She's the author of the book, The Beatles and the Historians, an analysis of writings about the Fab Four. And let's move on to the third narrative you cover in the book, the Shout narrative. Now, after the tragic murder of John Lennon in 1980, the first major biography of the group to come out was 1982's Shout by Philip Norman. Norman seems to have been someone who took the 1971 Rolling Stone interview to heart. <laughs> and again, despite Lennon's later backtracking on some of that stuff, the same stories are repeated, but now viewed through the grief Beatle fans were feeling at the time Lennon was killed. So John is elevated to almost saint-like status in, in this narrative. And once again, Paul is... <laughs> thrown under the bus. Well, not not only Paul. Paul certainly is the one who comes across in the shout narrative as the most diminished. Right. But George and Ringo oh. are virtual non-entities. Right. In the shout narrative. If you read the major works of the shout narrative, something like Shout, uh, particularly in the first edition, George and Ringo barely exist, or something in Ray Coleman's biography of John, Ray Coleman's Lennon, he claims that Elliot Mintz was closer to John than any of the Beatles. And it's a, a statement of pretty severe absurdity. But yes, Paul, particularly in something like Shout or Ray Coleman's book, there's an enormous amount of evidence to indicate, and Philip Norman at least has admitted, he went into that book with an anti-Paul McCartney bias. Right. And he wrote a book that has a significant number of methodological flaws in order to promote John and essentially criticize Paul and ignore Ringo and George. Yeah, I remember this period really well because I read all of these books, and uh, certainly a lot of Beatle fans in my generation were spoon-fed this notion that Paul was a dope and... George and Ringo were such lousy players, they're not even worth talking about. This shout narrative is, in fact, the interpretation of the Beatles story that I run into the most just via my own age group. And there's a real hostility out there toward any narrative that might contradict it. I, I mean, I know the book that Paul McCartney did with Barry Miles uh, many years from now is seen as Paul just trying to build himself up, but... When the story of the Beatles and his role in it has become so lopsided, you can kind of see why he did it. I think Many Years From Now is very much a direct response to Shout. We have, we have evidence that Paul hated Shout. Right. <laughs> with good reason. Yeah. And it's also a response to Lennon Remembers. It took him 27 years or so after Lennon Remembers to come up with it, but... You know, one of the things Paul keeps coming back to 
various times in many years from now is the issue of authorship of, again, Eleanor Rigby. Right. Because you have John publicly claiming primary authorship numerous times in the 70s and in the 1980 Playboy interview, and Paul in 1997 is saying, no, that was, that was primarily me. So given the depiction of Paul in the Let and Remembers and Shout Narratives, I'm glad he wrote many years from now. It is defensive, right. and it's certainly pro-Paul. <laughs> of course, yeah. But it's got some enormously important information in it, and that was a balance that did need to be, did need to be uh, put back in place, really. So let's talk about the last narrative you explore in the book, the uh, Lewison narrative. Now, Mark Lewison's book, The Complete Beatles Recording Sessions, yes. was released in 1988, and that's where he went song by song, take by take, and revealed who did what, why, and how. And it was a game changer. And at the same time, there was this deluge of high-quality Beatle bootleg recordings, about a hundred times more than what was previously available in the early 70s during that first uh, bootleg boom. I mean, that, that whole scene was put to shame. Uh, that completely altered a lot of opinions because fans now had access to session tapes that they had only ever dreamed about. Do you agree that this period uh, was sort of like a new golden age of Beatles research? I really do. I think... When you get that release of primary sources in the late 80s, that's when you see a major shift in what authors are saying, what methodology authors are using, and probably some of the, and this, this snowballs on itself. You can see it in secondary sources like Ian McDonald's Revolution in the Head. Right. And you can see it in further secondary sources, not just those done by Lewison, although his research really serves as the, the basis for a lot of these narrative shifts. Right. But probably the best example is that when you get to the late 90s and then more recently, uh, a few years ago, when you have Philip Norman completely reversing himself. Right. Right. on his interpretation of Paul as a musician, Paul as a human being. He, he, Norman still doesn't have much regard or time for George Ringo. Right. But that's another aspect that you see with Lewison, in part because of anthology, because of these bootlegs, is that George and Ringo get much more attention now yes. Yes. than they ever got in the Shout Narrative. Well, here's where I can let some of these authors from the 1970s and 80s off the hook. Uh, their books were written at a time when they simply did not have access to all of the research and information we now have. I think that's a very good point, but that's one of the reasons why one of the things I did when I was studying Beatles historiography, I didn't just read the first edition of a book, I read the second and the third. And if you read all the editions of Shout or all the editions of Ray Coleman's book, even after that evidence has become available, they don't change their interpretations. Yeah, you mentioned this earlier. Now we know how bad Alan Klein was for the group, but Rolling Stone magazine, until very recently, was still pushing the Lennon Remembers interview where Klein was praised as the savior-like figure. Uh, they're still pushing that as, you know, the be-all and end-all of the Beatles' breakup story. Right. So, I mean, you're absolutely right. Probably the author whose work I would argue is most impaired, the most major author whose work is most impaired by that lack of sources, would be someone like Nicholas Schaffner. He didn't have a chance right. to do a second or a third version of The Beatles Forever, and he was writing in the late 70s. Right. So he never got exposed to a lot of those sources. But the second edition of Shout came out in, I think, 2000. And so you had had the publication of the Complete Beatles recording sessions. You'd had many years from now. You'd had anthology. And Norman changes almost nothing. Right. Or you have, with Coleman, he writes the second edition of his John biography in 93, or it's published in 93. And again, he changes almost nothing. Then... Three years later, he's writing a biography of Paul, and he changes everything. 
Right. right. <laughs> he makes his public apology tour to Paul. It, it is. Although the ironic thing about Coleman is that he doesn't even, ad- he attacks other authors for promoting this shallow caricature of Paul while he was one of the major authors who contributed to that. Right. We touched on this earlier, but I do think it's important to bring up again. There are first and second and third generation fans who grew up believing in a certain version of or perspective on the Beatles story and asking them to reconsider what they believed in the 60s or the 70s or the 80s is almost like asking them to reject their own religion. (laughs) And I've noticed that, you know, they they get really bent out of shape about it, and they'll say, uh, oh, you're trying to rewrite history, or or they'll say, oh, it's revisionist history. That's what I hear all the time. Ah, you're just revisionist history. Well, it is very difficult, not just with the Beatles, but really with the historiography of any subject, to reject that initial narrative that you are exposed to. But it's necessary, because one of the things that inevitably happens in history is that new sources become available. Right. And new primary sources. And you have to incorporate those new primary sources into the new versions of Beatles history. And revisionism, again, it's a word that gets flung around in various ways as a bad thing. For historians, revisionism is not a bad thing so long as it is based on evidence. Right. We have revised, historians have revised the historiography of so many major subjects over the decades and over the centuries, from Cleopatra to African-American slavery in the United States to World War I. And how we teach those things now is drastically different from how we taught it 50 years ago. And and I should point out, not everyone is like that. I mean, most of the Beatle fans I know, they progress along with the new information as it becomes available. I mean, they, they bought the anthology CDs and they watched that program and they devoured uh, Lewison's tune-in book. So where do you see Beatles historiography going? I think a lot of where... Beatles historiography is going to go depends on Lewison and what interpretations, what conclusions he is going to draw in the next few volumes of his biography of the band. If we survive to read those next two volumes, because... That would be nice. Yeah, (laughs) because at at the slow rate... (laughs) Again, I'd rather he take his time and do it right than leave out information and issues like that, what I would hope is that Lewison, at least to me, in his first volume of Tune In, really reinforces this necessity of John and Paul as a partnership, as the driving force of the Beatles. He doesn't, at least in my mind, he doesn't diminish George and Ringo. He talks about how essential they are and were to the band's image, to their music, etc. But I think his phrase was, you know, John and Paul drove the bus. Right. So if Lewison continues in that interpretation, then I would hope that Beatles historiography, that a lot of the fans and that a lot of other authors would be able to move past this, this very, to my mind, toxic Lennon versus McCartney lens that Beatles historiography has been stuck with ever since 1970. Right. Uh, The other thing I would guess is that Beatles historiography post Lewison, particularly if he gets all of his volumes published, is going to focus more on narrower subjects, specialization. Right. Rather than someone else trying to write a massive biography. Speaking of uh, sources available and interpretations and books and things, do you have anything else coming up on the horizon? No books coming up on the horizon. I'm going to have a baby in July. Oh, well, (laughs) congratulations. You're you're going to be very busy. I am going to be very busy. So I was looking into doing some research on some other Beatles subjects, but that's going to have to go on the back burner for a for a bit of time. Well, thank you so much for coming on and uh, chatting with us, Aaron. Well, thank you. I had a great time. And and congrats on this uh, this future child who will know.
that it, there is no division with Lennon and McCartney. You don't, <laughs> you, you don't, uh, you know, build up one and diminish the other. No, no, no. Right. It's not a zero-sum game. Exactly. Exactly. 